Okay. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I'd like to invite or uh, welcome Josh Blackman, coming from South Texas College of Law in Houston. Uh, we're happy to have him speak to us on 3D printing guns and how that impacts the First Amendment. <clears throat> And the second man. Don't amendment. forget, don't, don't cheat him. <laughs> uh, Josh is a pro associate professor, as I mentioned, at South Texas College of Law in Houston, who specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He was selected by Forbes Magazine for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He has twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee, and most recently, he represented defense distributed in their lawsuit over 3D printed firearms, which made some buzz. And uh, so we're excited to have him here today. Please uh, reserve any questions you have for uh, after his presentation when we'll open it up and you can feel free to ask whatever you like. Very good, very good. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here at GW. Uh, I went to law school at George Mason, the other George right across the river. Uh, it's always fun to be here. Um, you are on for a treat today. You get not only one constitutional right, but two. Both of them, right? Yeah. Both constitutional rights. How 3D printed guns are protected by both the First and the Second Amendments. And this case is very personal to me. Um, I have been litigating this issue now since 2015. Uh, I represent the company that made this issue world famous, and uh, the litigation is still ongoing. So I'll give you an update of that towards the end of the talk. But let's start with the basics. How many of you have ever actually used a 3D printer? Yeah, what'd you make? A stick figure, okay, that's a good start. What, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. 3D printing is a way of designing an object on a screen, whether it's a car or a stick figure or even a house and translating that object into a real live device. Now let me just pause. This classroom's laid out in a very bad way. See, all of you are looking at the screen and not me, which is not your fault. Uh, but they should have the screen either right to my side or in your line of vision. So anyway, I blame GW, not you. But go ahead. You guys can keep going. All right, the, 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 the distance, the visual gap is just way too much. Anyway, I think about these things. Um, let me give you a brief tutorial on how 3D printing operates. Okay. Think back to your high school geometry class. A cylinder is basically a lot of circles stacked one on top of the other. Right? Makes sense. If I tell you I want to make a cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius of 5 inches, I would say create cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius of 5. Not so hard. I just taught you to program a 3D printer. It's actually not that complicated. You use fairly simple mathematical formulas, define the dimensions of what you want to print, and also define what kind of plastic you want to use, how durable it is, different questions like that. And with this simple code, sneezing. Okay, eventually. With this simple code, you too can make a 3D printed object. Now you can make lots of little trinkets, little balls. This is the idea of a race car being printed. And you can actually make out in the, little, in the bottom uh, the little race car. Just this laser pointer is not, there we go. And you make the, uh, a laser, uh, the race car right there. Okay. How does a 3D printer actually operate? Um, it operates very much like making a candle. Has anyone ever made a candle before? Yeah? Okay, how does this work, right? You take the wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax, you pull it out. And you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You keep dipping it over and over again. And every time you dip it, it gets a little bit thicker around the base. 3D printing works in the exact same fashion. But instead of dipping an object, you're spraying a very thin layer of plastic, liquid plastic, one at a time. So in this case, they're making a ball. And this little nozzle sprays a little bit of plastic one top of the other to make the object thicker and thicker and thicker. And this little uh, plate on the bottom moves around. So that way the nozzle stays stationary, 
but the plate moves around so the objects can be built up. Uh, sometimes the plates are heated so that the, uh, a plastic doesn't cool right away, but there are many different ways of operating this. Okay. Now I want to show you a demonstration of an object being printed. Okay. This 3D print will make an object which you will be able to see what it is in a moment. But you have to guess what's being printed. You have to predict. Okay. So I'm going to show you a series of photographs. You have to guess which one's being printed. Okay. So the first step, this is picture number one, is you lay down this sort of honeycomb lattice, right? It's a beehive almost. This is a very strong way of making objects. It's very durable. This is number one, number two, number three. Anyone see it yet? What? Brain, okay, close. Frog, close. Four. Five. Don't see it yet? It's a bust, that's correct. You're, you're very close. Pokemon's very close. Okay. Six. You'll see in the next one. People will sometimes get at this one. What? It is an alien, yeah. But but which one? Oh, who said it? Give that guy a free can of coke. Yeah, that's it. It's Yoda. Ready? Seven. Eight. There it is. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. 16, 17, 18. And it just sort of closes off the top. Now, this is a fairly intricate design, right? If you gave me a block of clay, I could never make that. If you gave me a block of wood, I could never chisel that. If you gave me, you know, stone, right? I could not make that. Metal, forget that, I can't call right. But if you give me a computer, I can make that. What 3D printing does is lets you take your creativity, your ideas, and translate them to the real world with physical objects. And you can print this Yoda maybe in maybe 20 or 30 minutes, maybe an hour, depending how good your printer is. But it's pretty quick. Now, you didn't invite me here today to talk about 3D printing Yoda, right? Uh, if this was about 3D printing Yoda, no one would really care. Uh, you invited me to talk about, of course, 3D printing firearms, guns. And that's where I entered this topic. Um, in 2013, uh, Cody Wilson was a law student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he didn't finish because he decided to have a side hobby. And Assad Hobby was building something called the Liberator. What the hell is this? This is the barrel, the 3D blueprints for the barrel of a fully functional plastic pistol. Now, the barrel of a gun really is nothing more than a cylinder. So I played a trick on you before, right? When I showed you how to code a cylinder, I was basically teaching you how to code components of a firearm. And this is what the barrel of the Liberator looks like. The bullet comes out of this little hole right there. Cody also figured out how to 3D print these. You know what these are. What is that? Yeah. It's a lower receiver for an AR-15. Um, this is the guts of, a, of an AR-15 that makes it work. Uh, the federal government only cares about this one part. You can buy every other aspect of an AR-15 in the mail without a background check, but this is the part that you need a background check for, unless you make it yourself. And people actually buy metal kits and they drill the holes into these different things to finish this off. Cody found a way to 3D print the lower receiver. He also found a way to 3D print a magazine. That is the box that holds the bullets. So these various gun components, you can now develop the 3D printer. Uh, but what put Cody on the map wasn't the magazine or the receiver. It was this. What the hell is this, right? 
This is the Liberator. These are the individual components for a fully functional plastic pistol. It has some metal, for example, the bullet is metal, and the, the nail, right, the firing pin is metal. Why do you need a nail? The nail hits the back of the bullet, and it's go pow. But everything else is made of plastic. These little squigglies over there, those are the springs that when you pull the hammer back, basically, it strikes the bullet. So all of these components could be 3D printed. And this is what the gun looks like when it's fully assembled. It's not very pretty. It's not very accurate. It's also not very safe. Um, the reason why we make guns out of steel is because steel is a very unique property. When steel heats up, it expands. When steel cools, it contracts. Plastic does not work like that. When plastic heats up, it melts. When plastic cools off, it cracks. It is very stupid to make a gun out of plastic because they're not going to work, okay? If you notice here, there's this rope in the background, this little yellow rope. Why is there a rope? Because when the gun was first being developed, it would keep blowing up when you pull the trigger. So they would put a little rope on the trigger, stand far away, and pull it. That way they wouldn't blow their hands up, okay? This is not a safe technology. And I've been on this issue now for six years. Plastic is never going to be a good substitute for metal. It's not. And these guns aren't accurate. There's no rifling. You can't really aim them well. Uh, they, they're single shot. This is not people, this is not something you should be kept up at night about, right? There are a lot more ways of making undetectable firearms than using a 3D printer. You can use wood, plastic, rubber. Lots of the materials are better than sort of 3D printed material. This is not a good idea. But Cody made international headlines. And around the world, people were panicking that now this armies of plastic guns would come into existence and be used to assassinate world leaders and uh, uh, smuggle them into the Super Bowl and uh, you know, everything else you can imagine. It was mostly paranoia, right? This gun takes about a week to make with you know, maybe $30,000, $40,000 worth of equipment, right? This, this is not any sort of imminent threat. This, I don't think it's even a threat in five or 10 years. This is a very remote threat. This could actually be a meaningful tool used to kill people. Uh, but people like to panic. That's what government usually does. They, they, they panic and try to ban stuff. But is there a problem, right? Um, is there a problem with 3D printing your own weapon? Now, when I usually say 3D print your own firearm, this is basically what people have in mind, right? Uh, where you point, click, and a gun pops out. Uh, my friends, this is not how it works. There's a lot of work that goes into it. The Liberator might take a full week to print all the components, like a 40-hour work week. You can't just, like, bang. Uh, you have to do a lot of effort into editing the code and modifying the code and choosing your materials. You even have to treat the barrel with this acetone bath to harden, to strengthen the plastic so it won't blow up in your hand. There's a lot of work that's to be done to make one of these guns functional. It's not, it's not automatic. But if you want to make a gun at home, you don't need a 3D printer. You can make a zip gun. Anyone ever know what a zip gun is? Yeah, when I give this talk in different parts of the country, the answers are different, right? Uh, I'm in the Northeast now, so I have to be a little bit different. A zip gun is a homemade gun. I could go down to the local hardware store buy $10 worth of parts to make a fully functional firearm that works. For example, I found this picture on the internet somewhere. It's a gun made out of a garden hose, nozzle, and a soldering iron. Soldering iron or garden hose. Imagine that, a fully functional gun that will actually not blow up in your hand with that $10 worth of parts. I found this other instruction kit. This is a keychain flashlight that's used to make a firearm. Because if you think about it, a firearm is nothing more than a tube that a bullet flies out of, right? That's all a gun is. And they're different shapes and sizes, bigger bullets, smaller bullets. But a gun is basically a tube 
That's something you can fly out of, won't blow up. Think of a cannon back in the olden days, right? Or a musket. It's, it's, you can improve the technology. It's a fairly basic idea, right? If you're looking to commit harm, you don't need much. Exhibit A. Okay. I'm going to show you a demonstration. Do not try this at home. These guys are morons. I mean that sincerely. They're idiots. And the flip phone camera should be the first indication that they are not serious about what they're doing. Okay. So what are these guys doing? They're going to make a rifle out of a piece of rubber tubing. That's this little, little tube over there. A metal pipe and a shotgun shell. They're going to make a rifle. How? On the tip, on the edge of the metal pipe is this little dimple. That's going to be the firing pin. We're going to jam that metal pipe into the shotgun shell. How? See it? They're loading the shotgun shell, the red shell, into the black rubber tube. And they're going to jam it. Okay, so take a step back for a minute. What's wrong with this picture? Well, every, everything, yeah, you're, you're right. But what, in particular, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. Yeah, that might blow up in his hand and he'll, he'll have one hand. Or two, maybe zero hands. What else is wrong with this picture? There's nothing to stop the shooting Yeah, and, and in fact, his hand is actually in front of the barrel and there's nothing behind it. So there's also something wrong if anyone spots it. What's going on over here? Anyone see it? There's no backstop. In fact, let me show you the next frame. It's even worse. There's an electrical outlet with wires that are plugged into a fan. And you can see that there are several holes on the cardboard box we're shooting into. So they've done this before. OK, so I'm, I'm showing you this not to make fun of these guys. I'm sure they're nice. They're probably really cool. But it's easy as hell to make a lethal weapon. It's so easy. It's so simple, right? You don't need a $50,000 3D printer and a week of labor to make one of these things. You can go buy one on the street, I'm sure a few blocks from here, without much difficulty, which is a hell of a lot better than what you get here. Anyway, ready? They're going to fire it. One, two, boom. Lethal weapon. And amazingly, they didn't kill themselves. Um, they're all proud of the, the shotgun smoking, the shell smoking. Um, rubber tube and a shotgun shell, that's all you need. Uh, they use a metal pipe here. They can really use anything sharp. It didn't have to be metal. It could be wood even. Um, did these guys break the law? Right? Is it a crime to make your own weapon and shoot it inside your house? Now, there might be ordinances about discharging a weapon indoors, and I don't want to get into that because those aren't very important. But is a mere act of making your own weapon illegal? Um, under federal law, the answer is no. Uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives has said, you can make your own weapon uh, with certain limitations. You can't have a short barreled shotgun. You can't have an automatic weapon. But as a general matter, you can make your own gun. You can't sell it. If you sell it, and put into the stream of commerce, you need a license, and then you go to jail for a lot of time if you don't have a license, right? But making your own weapon is perfectly legal. Then why am I involved, right? If it's legal to print your own gun, then what's the legal issue? Why are lawyers even involved here? What the federal government and now the state governments have started doing is not only trying to ban the printing of these weapons, they've tried to ban the sharing of the files of the information used to print these weapons. And these sorts of laws implicate the First Amendment. Um, now, you may have taken con law, maybe you haven't, but the basic tenet, the basic principle of the First Amendment is that the government cannot impose a prior restraint on speech. They can't stop you from speaking in advance. And they also can't impose what are called content-based restrictions. 
that is restricting the speech based on its content, right? They can't say, uh, you know, you can talk about everything except for this one issue. That's a content-based restriction. It might also be a viewpoint-based restriction as well, but they're, they're related. Um, here, at least New Jersey has enacted a statute that makes it a crime to share information that might be used to make a firearm, right? It's a crime to share information that might be used to make a firearm. Okay. We have a lot of problems with the statute, right? I'll give you an easy example that uh, uh, someone actually raised at oral arguments, right? What happens if I put online the blueprints needed to make a toy gun, right? It's a toy. It's non-operational. It's just the outline of a gun. There's nothing inside. There's no, there's no, there's no guts in it. And I put this file online. And then someone modifies it and makes it fully functional. Under our reading of the New Jersey statute, I am now a criminal for sharing information used that can be used to make a gun. I'll take one step further. The law even applies to the components that may be used to make a gun. Right, components. So if I put online a design for a screw or a nut or a bolt, which has a million possible uses, and then someone decides to use that to build a gun, I'm now a felon. Uh, these are broad statutes. I think they have serious constitutional problems. But you might say, wait a minute, Josh, you can't use the First Amendment to shield criminal activity, right? You're, these files are teaching you, they're showing you, they're helping you commit crimes. Um, has one ever used the anarchist cookbook? Right? This is basically a hand guide to be a terrorist. I'm not exaggerating much. Um, it tells you how to make bombs, how to make poisons, how to do various things of this sort. Okay? Uh, there were efforts back in the 60s and 70s to ban this book, and those efforts failed. Um, the mere fact that speech might show you how to do something that might be illegal doesn't mean you can punish the publisher. Now, if I give you step-by-step -step instructions of how to assassinate someone, step-by-step, -step, okay, meet him here, he's gonna go outside there, stand in this building at this angle, okay, I think I can be charged as an accomplice in the crime. I, I think I'll go that far. But merely publishing a book or a file with any intent is not enough to punish under the First Amendment. But wait a minute, you say, Josh, this isn't speech, right? This is, this is a, not a book, this is code. Um, Increasingly, the courts are holding, and I think these holdings are correct, that information speech, that the mere fact that you choose to express yourself with electronic medium doesn't deprive you of first amendment value. And I think this is actually a, a difficult question, right? Where do you draw the line between expressive speech, machine code, right? I think these are hard, hard lines to draw. But our files are expressive. They convey information. They're displayed in museums and art galleries. Uh, students study them in design school, right? These are expressive files. Wherever you draw the line, I am confident we're on the correct side of the line. And indeed, the Supreme Court's recognized that the First Amendment protects not only the creation of speech, but also dissemination, right? There's a right to speak and a right to be heard. It's a two-way street. And it's not enough to keep a file on your hard drive. You create information to share it. Information wants to be free. And that's the basis of our lawsuit, okay? We're all in the Matrix. We're surrounded by code. God, the ten, is this the 20th anniversary of the Matrix? Did I read that right? Oh my God, I'm going to date myself. I think I was, a, I was in ninth grade when that movie came out, and it blew me away. Most of you were in elementary school. Yeah, something like that. But I, I was in ninth grade when I was like, oh my God, I didn't understand it. The first time I saw it, the movie made no sense to me. But then maybe third or fourth time I finally understood it. The sequels, though, were terrible. Don't, don't, don't even talk about the sequels. All right, but I promise you not only one amendment, I promise you two. Uh, we also think the Second Amendment has a lot to say about this case. Uh, we are in D.C., right? You guys know the Second Amendment here. It provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The case that made this amendment famous was D.C. v. Heller. District of Columbia v. Heller, right here in the district. Uh, your fair city government, I'm not sure why you have a city government, you have a city government, um, 
ban the possession of handguns, the most commonly used weapon. And in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court said you can't do that, that that ban is unconstitutional. And two years later, in a case called McDonald v. Chicago, the court held that the Second Amendment restricts not only federal action, it also restricts state action. It was incorporated. And therefore, the Chicago handgun ban also fell. Okay? This is a great picture of Dick Keller and Otis McDonald at the Supreme Court. Uh, I was there that day. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a long time ago. I actually camped out. This was when I was a student, but I was at Mason. I camped out at the Supreme Court for the entire night to get to McDonald. Uh, this is before the line wing thing became a huge deal, but this was maybe 2010 or 11. And uh, just one pro tip, if you ever wait, said, everyone's at the court, everyone's at the arguments. If you haven't, you should go, just even for a short and an unimportant case. Uh, but the sprinklers come on at 3 in the morning. Uh, they wake you up real quick. Uh, and it was cold that night. It was snowing and sleeting. It was a cold night, but worth it. Uh, but since Heller and McDonald, the court hasn't taken or hasn't decided any other big Second Amendment cases. We actually have another one coming up next year involving a New York pistol carry case. Uh, but so far, the court's just been silent. So I'm going to make two arguments, right? I think the Second Amendment is not just a right to have a gun, but a right to acquire it. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine DC passed a law, you can imagine them passing that, it says, if you already have a gun, you can keep it. This is Heller, by the way. If you already have a gun, you can keep it, but you can't buy any new guns, right? If you have a gun, keep it, no one buys new guns. So basically, until these people die out, we're fine, right? No problem. I think such a law would be unconstitutional. I think at a minimum, the right to bear arms means you have some right of obtaining it. Now, I think there are restrictions. You can have background checks and the like. I don't have a problem with those as a general matter. Um, but I think there's a right to acquire arms. Uh, the second right I'm a lot more uh, bullish, or maybe, maybe we should say gun uh, gunnish about, right? Uh, a right to make arms. Long before there were firearm stores where you could buy a gun, people made their own weapons, right? When the militiamen at Bunker Hill needed weapons, they couldn't go down to Walmart, right? These were mostly homemade muskets and muskets made on the farm. They would make their own musket balls out of molten lead, right? Um, there's a very long standing tradition in America of gunsmithing, of making your own weapon. Indeed, to this day, federal law does not ban manufacturing your own weapons. It doesn't, because I think we have a deeply rooted right to make your own guns. And the Second Amendment here plays an important role in what's called a hybrid right. And if you study an employment division versus Smith, um, Justice Scalia talks about this. What's a hybrid right? I'll give you an example. Let's say a state makes it a crime to wish someone a Merry Christmas, an actual war on Christmas, right? It's a crime to say Merry Christmas. Is that a violation of free speech? Or is that a violation of free exercise? both. There are certain ways in which rights reinforce each other. They're called hybrid rights, right? Where if you ban someone from talking about their religion, it, it's doubly unconstitutional. Uh, I'll give a contrary example. Uh, let's say the state passes a law that bans books but how to perform abortions, right? Uh, the state passes a law that bans publishing instruction of how to perform an abortion, for example, right? Is that a violation of due process or free speech? Maybe a little bit of both. And the answer might be both, right? Uh, when you have these heightened rights, the scrutiny gets a little bit even tighter. Uh, so here, the, the state, New Jersey and others, are banning the sharing of information of how to make a gun, how to acquire a gun. And in this way, I think that these laws run about both the First and the Second Amendment standing on their own, and these two rights operating as a hybrid. Um, so far, courts haven't adopted my theory, but I think it's good. And I think eventually we'll win, eventually. Okay, so what laws are on the books now? Well, for the last 30 years, we've had something called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was enacted in 1988. Wait a minute, Josh. 1988? You guys weren't even born yet, right? I thought this plastic gun thing was like from 2013, like five years ago. Plastic guns aren't new. Undetectable weapons are very old. They've been around for a long time. And in some regards, the old school undetectable weapons are easier to make than the 3D printed weapons. 
right? This law says all guns must have enough metal in them to trigger a magnetometer, a metal detector. Why were people in the 80s worried about plastic guns? Well, they had a misconception of the Glock handgun. Uh, in fact, Bruce Willis in one of the Die Hard movies has this one line, which is completely false, but it's an awesome line. He says, luggage that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up in your airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Now, everything he says false, everything, right? There is no Glock 7. It's not made of porcelain, it's made of metal. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. But people have been panicking about these undetectable guns forever. Let me tell you something, you know what's metal? A bullet. <laughs> this is so stupid. You go through an airport x-ray machine, you have, a, you have like a nickel in your pocket, it goes off, right? Bullets are made out of metal. Okay. So I guess you can maybe knock some of the head with a plastic gun, I don't know, but you need bullets. Anyway, this is, what I'm trying to get across is this is not a rational fear. This is primarily people who have this idea that you click and this, this like, you know, fully functional automatic weapon pops out of your printer, your HP, right? And then you just, it's plastic, and you just run around through metal detectors, that ain't nothing. Body scanners, x-ray machines, these are all detectable, right? Like, I have baby wipes now in my backpack and they find them with the body scanner thing, right? It, it, anyway, I, I digress, okay. So, there have been efforts to ban 3D guns. Uh, Senator Schumer, who loves to ban things, tried. Uh, back in 2014, he failed. Uh, he, he always has pictures of him standing next to things he wants to, to criminalize. This is his, his, his you know, routine. Um, I saw one proposal that said that the prospect of 3D guns are so dangerous that we should ban 3D printing. We should ban printing plastic materials. Let me tell you something, guys. You can 3D print metal, like Terminator style, right? This is a fully functional 1911 handgun 3D printed metal. Now, why would you do this? This thing costs $40,000. It's insane. You can buy a gun for maybe 200 bucks on the, on, on the cheap, right? And again, people say, oh, Josh, technology progresses. I've been doing this now for five years. Things haven't moved, right? Printing stuff with a 3D printer is not cheap, right? It's not quick. It's a good way of prototyping, right? Putting together a design that you want to test out, see how it works. That's what 3D printing is good for. You can't mass manufacture an army. I, one of the judges in one of our courts said something like, well, you know, what if you know, terrorists get a hold of these things? When I, I litigated one of these cases, I swear to God, the Washington Attorney General said that, I, I swear, MS-13 agents will cross over the Canadian border with plastic guns. I, I say again, the Washington AG was arguing there, and I swear, I got the transcript, <laughs> and he said, we're worried about MS-13 and dangerous gangs smuggling plastic guns across the Canadian border. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, 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 this is not real. It's, 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 it's paranoia, right? I mean, there's right-wing paranoia, the, the emergency on the border. There's left-wing paranoia, plastic guns, right? We all have our own paranoia. We all try to pass laws to ban things that aren't real, uh, and that, that's where we are. Okay. So then how'd they get my guy, right? How did Cody first get in trouble? Well, f the federal government didn't have a ban on plastic guns. In fact, the Liberator, actually required a block of metal to be installed, so Cody's end product comply with the law. Instead, they came down on him through export control laws. Uh, you probably never been exposed to this, uh, but as a general matter, when you export certain types of arms, you have to comply with ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation. Okay, what is ITAR? Well, let's say you want to send a Stinger missile to Afghanistan. Okay, probably a bad idea. I think you need the government's permission to send a Stinger missile to Afghanistan. I think we can all agree it's a good idea, right? Let's say I want to send the blueprints to a nuclear submarine to China. Okay. okay, the government might have a interest to stop me from sharing that information. I'm with them, right? But when you have an open source file that's been downloaded thousands of times in the public domain, can the State Department, two blocks right over there, right? Can the State Department tell you, no, you can't share this information. 
The government had never before used this regime for public speech or open source public domain information. They've just never used a law in this fashion until Cody. In May of 2013, they sent him a letter ordering him to take down the Liberator blueprints. Right? Read the red part. It says, this means that all such data should be removed from public access immediately. It's a takedown notice, right? It's a takedown notice. To remove open source code from the internet of how to make a weapon. Never before had the government used the law in this manner. Never before. And actually not since. Uh, this letter was from 2013. We filed a lawsuit in federal court in Austin in 2015, just before the two-year statute ran out. Uh, at the time, my co-counsel was Alan Gura, who litigated Heller and McDonald. Uh, we brought this lawsuit, and we argued that the State Department's regime violated the First Amendment, violated the Second Amendment, it was vague, violated due process, and a few other administrative claims. Uh, we lost in the district court. On the, um, on the Fifth Circuit, we split the panel two to one. We had a very good dissent from Judge Edith Jones, which I'm grateful for, uh, but dissents don't give you a victory. Uh, we petitioned for a hearing on Bonk. I think we got four or five dissents from Bonk, but not enough to flip the court. And then we petitioned for certiorari. Supreme Court denied review. So then we went back down to the district court, and we were, we were actually feeling pretty good. Right? We were up at the Supreme Court on a preliminary injunction, and you know it's hard to win a PI. Right? You have to show what's called irreparable harm. It's actually a very high burden. So we were pretty good that in summary judgment we'd win. Um, and the judge said, you try to engage in settlement discussions. And we did. And the government came back and said, we want to settle the case. They said, we've determined that our own rule is probably unconstitutional. And we want to change it and adopt a different rule that removes this censorship. They want to shift how they approve foreign arms controls. They said, sure, great. Then began the battle. So I'll give you the end result. In five days, I argued four TROs in four different courts, four temporary restraining orders. I had 90 hours billed in five days. So let's just walk through this one day at a time, right? So the settlement was supposed to go into effect Friday. Dates are important, just Friday. On Tuesday or it's got, I can't remember, Tuesday or Wednesday, we get this letter from the from the gun control groups, the Brady campaign, every town for gun violence, Giffords, all these people, right? All of Michael Bloomberg's alter egos, right? Um, and they said, we want to intervene. We want a temporary restraining order, TRO, to block your settlement. And we thought, what the hell is this? What do you mean block our settlement? Who the hell are you to block our settlement? We, we negotiate this with the government. And they filed this TRO. I went down to Austin, or actually, they're kind of up to Austin for it, Houston. And I argued it, and the judge actually denied the TRO. This was number one. Um, at that time, Cody had planned to post the files the following week. But I told Cody, look, Cody, we have our license. Post the files now. Post them immediately. Because I don't know what other kind of chicanery these other parties are going to do. Because I figured the Brady campaign was like the last, you know, the first wave. And I was right. And at that time, I said, we have to go on offense. Um, New Jersey, the AG, a guy named Graywall, had sent us a number of cease and desist letters telling us to stop what we're doing, kind of ignored them. I said, this guy's going to sue us. And I said, you know what? If he's smart, he's going to sue us in state court on a state law issue so we can't remove it. Right? There's no diversity jurisdiction once attorney general. And I said, this guy's going to sue us in state court. Let's sue him first. So I spent that entire weekend preparing a federal complaint against New Jersey in federal court in Austin. And I was about to file it on Sunday afternoon when I get this frantic email. The Pennsylvania Attorney General had sued us in federal court in Philadelphia, seeking a TRO to block us from posting the files. I called the Pennsylvania lawyer and said, we've already posted the files. Your entire motion is moot. And he's like, no, you haven't. I'm like, yeah, I have. So I said, here's a link. He's like, well, right, right, right. He said, the, the, these guys spent their entire week preparing a motion that was irrelevant. They didn't check the damn websites if the files were online. They didn't even bother checking it, right? My guy posted them. They're online. So I said, this is stupid. We already posted it. He's like, well, I still want to have the judge hear it. They wanted an ex parte TRO, right? And they sued us in federal court. 
All right. So at that point, we went ahead, we filed our New Jersey suit, and then we heard back from the Pennsylvania judge. He came into the office on a Sunday. He said, I want to have a hearing now. I was in New York at the time. And so I actually had to take, I'm not joking, I had to take a TRO oral argument from LaGuardia Airport, the worst airport in the United States. I was at the United Lounge at LaGuardia Airport, and I argued a TRO by phone. <laughs> now, the motion was, 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 was bizarre. They brought state law claims in federal court with no federal question. The judge actually asked the Pennsylvania lawyer, have you ever actually litigated a federal case before? It was pretty brutal. I was like, oh man, this is good. So um, they, they were arguing back and forth. I said, I said, Judge, Your Honor, the files are online already. I don't know what relief they're seeking. He's like, well, okay. So then they said, well, we don't want to just stop the files. We want people in Pennsylvania not to access them, right? I'm like, okay. So I'll tell you what. I told the judge, like, look, we have, it's Sunday. I haven't had time to brief this issue. We will voluntarily block all Pennsylvania IP addresses. Right, so if you're coming from Pennsylvania IP address, we'll block access. And the judge said, you know what? I agree with Mr. Blackman, that's fine. He denied the TRO as moot, and I said, we'll come back later, we'll figure this out later, but I'll just block New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania. I didn't care about Pennsylvania, I just didn't want the site coming down, okay? So that was Sunday, I then flew home, got home, got almost no sleep, because I knew something was coming next. Monday morning, stuff starts stirring. I started hearing all these reports that we're going to be sued by like 20 states. I'm like, oh, okay, that's nice. So first, we get sued by the New Jersey Attorney General, as we expected, but he sues us in state court. Ready for this? He sued us in chancery court, at right, the court of equity, right? Ready for this? He sought a nationwide injunction against us in Essex County Chancery Court. <laughs> That guy's got some chutzpah. I mean, that, 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 that's a, that, good for him, right? Waste my time. I'll get the fees eventually. Um, and he sued us. He wanted an ex parte TRO, meaning the judge won't even have a hearing first. And to his credit, I think the judge in New Jersey had this thing dumped on his lap on Monday. You know, Chance Report does like, you know, nuisance issues, right? If your neighbor has loud music or something, right? Like, you know. I respect that judge. He had this dumped on his lap. I think he did as best as he could with it. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to give you the ex parte TRO. I want a hearing tomorrow. So at this time, I was back in Houston. I'm like, okay, there's no one flying to New Jersey. We're getting sued somewhere else. I can't be in three places at once. Let me just stay in Houston. I'll keep working all night. So I agreed to do the thing by phone. Um, okay, so that was Monday. The Monday afternoon, I get a phone call from the Washington Attorney General. And the, the attorney was like, um, do you represent these clients? Yes. Do you accept process for them? Like, what's the claims? Like, we're going to sue you. I'm like, sue me for what? I can't tell you, but will you accept process? I'm like, do I have a choice? Uh, I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. It, I, I could have dragged it out. It wouldn't have mattered. Uh, so I said, fine, I'll accept process. Um, a coalition of, I think, 13 states and eventually 20 AGs sued us in Washington. They also sued the State Department. They argued that our settlement violated the APA. One more time. Our settlement agreement violated the Administrative Procedure Act. Now, who knew that a settlement agreement had to comply with the APA? Who knew that was even a thing, right? <laughs> I knew that was a thing. I could, we were laughing at these claims, but we lost, right? So that was Monday. Okay, fast forward to Tuesday. In the afternoon, I had my argument with the New Jersey Chancery Court. And I'm on speakerphone. I mean, this is, you know, this, this court was not built for interconferencing stuff. It was basically a speakerphone at the judge's desk. And I could barely hear a damn thing. Uh, and then I told the judge, probably a little ballsy, I said, uh, Your Honor, with all due respect, I don't think a chance requires jurisdiction to issue a nationwide injunction. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you might be right, Mr. Blackman. Uh, uh, <laughs> I took a risk. And at the end of the hearing, I said, look, judge, I'll give you the same offer I gave New Jersey. I'm sorry, Pennsylvania. I will go and I'll block all New Jersey IP addresses such that people in New Jersey can't access the site. And then New Jersey said, oh, but wait a minute. If you're on a cell phone and you're in Newark and you connect to a tower in Manhattan, I was like, okay, fine, I'll block mobile access. Okay. This has never been done before. This is like North Korea level stuff, right? Usually you don't block things on a state by state basis. It's never, been, we, we figured this stuff out in real time. It was actually very difficult to do. But I said, judge, we will make our best efforts in the interim to get this resolved, to block all people in New Jersey, as well as uh, 
mobile access. You say, well, people start faking their IP address, like Judge, come on. I, 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 we're, doing, we're doing everything we can. What you're basically asking is to take down the internet worldwide, right? Take down a site, the entire world. So the judge went through this long proceeding, and again, I think he, I think he handled it as, as well as he could have, and he said, I'm going to deny the TRO based on Mr. Blackman's representation that he'll block the IP address. I said, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. To that point, I had three TROs. I won basically three of them. I was like, okay, feeling pretty good, right? Then I have the Washington oral argument, which is you know, two hours behind, three hours behind, so a little later in the day. Uh, this was primarily a case against the State Department, but I was there for reasons I still don't understand. Uh, and I made this argument at the First Amendment, and I was talking about the Pentagon Papers case and how this is violation of free speech. The judge asked me one question in Seattle. What was that question? Mr. Blackman, do you represent all the parties? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna lose, aren't I? That means if I can issue a judgment, it can bind everyone. I'm like, Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and he ruled from the bench, he granted the TRO. And at that point, our settlement was blocked, we lost our license. And I had to make the very difficult call to Cody. I said, Cody, we lost. You gotta take the website down. And we, we, we were both crying. It had been emotional. We'd done this, this marathon, 90 hours and five days up and down. And it took Cody a couple hours to actually take down the site because he has a lot of firewalls and blocking and redundancy. It was actually not that easy to take down the site. We complied. That was almost a year ago. That was last summer of 20, uh, 2018. We're still litigating. We're still litigating in Seattle. We're still litigating in Austin. We're still litigating in Newark, New Jersey. These cases keep going up and down. Eventually, I think they will all converge at the Supreme Court, God willing, in the next year or so, because uh, I'm getting tired of this case. No, actually not. It's actually fun. I'm enjoying it. But this is a case that just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, and I think ultimately will prevail. Uh, there are a lot of ways we should prevail. The First Amendment's good. Uh, I don't think states can regulate the internet at all. There's preemption, there's supremacy clause, there's dormant commerce clause. There are a lot of reasons why New Jersey should lose. A lot of reasons why they should lose. And a lot of reasons why we should win. I'll stop here and I'll take some questions. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, so this, is, this has nothing to do with um, 3D printed, uh, nothing with 3D printed guns. Um, when you have litigation with multiple parties, right, uh, each party must be represented by an attorney. It's not a given that the lawyer in front of you represents all the parties. And if that lawyer doesn't represent all the parties, then he can't make decisions on behalf of them. He can't make representations on behalf of them. So in theory, had I only represented half the parties, the other parties would not have been represented, and that becomes basically a judgment of that representation. It makes, makes more of a headache for the judge. Now, he was gonna issue the opinion he was gonna issue no matter what I did, right? And, and, and actually, to be perfectly, perfectly frank, there was one of the parties who I hadn't spoken to in a long time, and I don't know that he was my, my client at that juncture, right? I think I may have corresponded with him early on, but he sort of just fell off the side. So I don't even know if I represent all the parties, but in the pinch, I stood up. You learn about this in legal ethics where sometimes where there's a person who needs representation and in an emergency, you do it, right? I hadn't been admitted to the bars of any of those states, right? I, I hadn't been admitted to Prague Vice. They just let me argue. Um, I had local counsel I found very quickly. By the way, finding gun, pro-gun lawyers in New Jersey and Washington, hard. There aren't any. They don't exist. They're like endangered species. Uh, but I argued in courts I was admitted to. I was filing briefs with rules I wasn't familiar with. Uh, but when you have a 24-hour TRO, you don't have a choice. You always see in TV, oh, you know, 25 states through the Trump administration, a nationwide injunction, right? But they have entire offices of lawyers who can handle that crap. It was just me and one other lawyer doing all this work. And we had some good local counsel helping us. But it, 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 it's, it's a lot of work. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. Th I, th I think. I think it's a. It's a good question. Um, the issue with nationwide injunctions isn't so much whether they apply uh, uh, beyond the district of the court. Um, it, it's whether they bind 
all people, right? Um, the, the federal government generally appears in all different states, uh, but in a lot of cases, I think the court could limit relief to the name party. So I'll use my litigation as an example, right? Um, let's say, in fact, that I was violating New Jersey law, which, which I wasn't. I think it would be totally within the power of the courts to perhaps limit access to the site in New Jersey, right? Whether that's a five, First Amendment violation, I don't care, but as a jurisdictional matter, they could have limited the remedy to people in New Jersey. Now, is that perfect? No. Can people spoof their IP addresses? Can they drive across state lines and come back? Of course. But I do think there's a, an important limitation that a court's uh, judgment should not be broader than it needs to be to affect the relief they have. And if the problem is I'm violating New Jersey law in New Jersey, I think blocking IP addresses was an acceptable solution, which is why I volunteered that. I actually proposed that, look, I will voluntarily block their IP so we figure this matter out. We actually called it the blue wall. Basically, the entire eastern seaboard and much of the west, basically all the Hillary states, were just walled off from the internet. Like, again, that had never been done before. We figured that stuff out on the fly. It was, it was pretty ambitious, and I, I give Cody a lot of credit. Yes, sir. Dude, everywhere. Uh, this will probably go up in the fifth, ninth, and third simultaneously. Um, it, it's very complicated, and, and I wish I wasn't in so many courts, uh, but that's based on how we were sued and where we were sued. Are you hoping for a circuit split? That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Uh, that'd be nice. I mean, I didn't even mention, after I called Cody to take down the website, this is actually the funniest part, my phone rings, and it's an unlisted number. I'm like, oh, great. What, what now? And I pick up the phone, and he says, this is Governor Andrew Cuomo. I'm like, Huh? <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, this is Governor Andrew. I was like, hello, Governor. He's like, do you represent the gun guy? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I want you to take down your files. And I said, Governor, your AG sued us and just got a nationwide injunction against us. You, you already won. And he's like, well, I don't know about that. I'm like, well, you guys already won. He's like, well, I want you to take down the files. I'm like, I was like, we already did. <laughs> and then he says, well, you know what? She doesn't work for me. And then he started complaining that in New York, the AG is an independent office, not appointed by the governor. He's like, well, she doesn't work for me. I don't, I don't control her. But I want you to take I'm like, OK, fine. I said, tell, tell your legal staff to send me a letter, and I'd be happy to have it. Um, we actually used that phone call as a jurisdictional element to get to Texas federal court. Because he <laughs> called me in Texas. Did, didn't work, but, but I, tried, I tried using it. Um, yeah, this case just went on forever. And, and uh, it was, I'll write a book about this eventually. There's just a, a lot of stuff that happened. Jeez, I wish I knew. I, I hope, I hope that we can get a, get to the Supreme Court, not the 2019 term, maybe the 2020 term. It's maybe in two years. That's my hope, but you know, I don't know. There are a lot, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces, and part of it also depends on the, uh, what the Trump administration is doing with the State Department appeal. So, it's complicated. Yeah. No. So the Washington judge, the nationwide injunction, the effect of that is that nationwide uh, people are no longer allowed to um, uh, share these files. That was the effect of the Washington judge's ruling. And I, I said, Judge, if you issue this ruling, it's not just stopping us, it's stopping people across the United States. You're censoring, I had one line in my brief, you're censoring 300 million Americans. And that, that didn't, that didn't. If you, if you, had those files, then... you can possess them. Here's the damnedest thing, right? You can possess them, but you can't share them electronically, right? I can hand you a thumb drive. It's fine. I can put a thumb drive in an envelope with a stamp, and that's fine. But if I email it to you, I'm a criminal. And in fact, what Cody started doing after that ruling was he started mailing people thumb drives with the files. Because <laughs> the judge in Washington said, you can mail them. You have other alternatives. So he started selling the damn thing. You know, he's mailing them. I think, yeah, yeah. Please. States are increasingly banning self-manufacture. California has a little bit, but New Jersey has a much more rigorous regime. It's a, oh, I, I'm from Staten Island, which makes it very fun every time the flight of New York coming. It's served my land. Um, I do worry about these things, right? Uh, yeah, New Jersey has basically made it a crime to make any weapon at home without a license. And it's not like a license you can obtain easily. It's to be a manufacturer. I, I think there are problems with that regime. Now, if New Jersey said you can't have a plastic gun, you have to have a serial number. I think under Heller, those are okay. 
But to actually ban any home manufacturer, I do think is constitutionally problematic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right here. We, we, argue, we argue that the New Jersey law uh, doesn't pass strict scrutiny. It doesn't pass intermediate scrutiny. I don't even think it passes rational basis. It makes it a crime to share information that may be used to make a firearm or firearm components. I mentioned earlier, it bans screws and nuts, right? Uh, it bans making a toy gun that can be modified to a real gun, right? It's so overbroad and has no narrow tailoring. I don't think it passes any scrutiny at all. But yeah, we argue under strict or intermediate. I, I think it even flunks rational basis. It's such a poorly designed statute. Yes, sir. Um, I know Supreme Court also had the um, initiative to like CSC machine gun eighty percent receivers. Yep. Was that code also involved in these suits? Was it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if you don't know what CNC, it's uh, it was a computer numeric control, right? It's basically milling. The same way if you have like a jig and you drill holes in a piece of metal or whatever, uh, you can do the same thing with um, uh, uh, the parts of a gun. Uh, the, the, the machine itself, the ghost gunner, it's basically just a drill. That can be sold anywhere. You don't need a license to have that device. But the code used to power the CNC mill, that code also the government wants to restrict. So the way Cody does it now is he mails you a thumb drive, and that's how they get around it. I mean, it's. It's so silly. This entire thing is b bizarre, right? The government's okay with us mailing these thumb drives, we can't email it. Th that's where we are. I mean, th th that, that's what I've been fighting five years for, that you can mail this stuff, but you can't email it. Okay. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, contempt of court, which means jail. This is, they hold you in. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll make this point. After the. Well, you have to have knowledge, but after the judge issues his order, I, I was on the phone and said, Your Honor, may I just be clear? Are you ordering my client to take down the website? And he said, No, I'm not ordering him to take down the website. I said, Your Honor, as a consequence of your ruling, it's now illegal for my client to have his website up. And the judge made some comments saying, Well, sometimes anarchists break the law, you know. And. I, I actually clapped back and I said, Your Honor, my, my client always complies with court orders, which he does. And he says, well, I was making a joke. He sort of, sort of just you know, brushed it off. Uh, I had reporters from the AP and Reuters calling me like, what the hell is that, right? Why is he, why is he making him your client? And in fact, he had an opinion. This judge in Seattle had an opinion. We actually quoted his line where he talked about my anarchist client. He actually quoted the transcript to show that there was no order against my client. So he was actually proud of that line, I suppose. Uh, but had the judge issued that order, well, to be precise, had the judge issued the order and Cody didn't take down the files, the judge in Seattle have had no power to do anything. But at that point, he could have been indicted by the feds for breaking export control law, which you don't want to do either. But I could have been held to contempt by the Pennsylvania and the New Jersey judges. So it was after I promised that we will block the IP addresses, we had to figure out how to do that. And that was my response. I told the judge we're going to do it. We had to do it. Yeah. We have one of those, yeah. The statutes are real vague. Com information that may be used to manufacture a farm, what the hell does that mean? That can be anything. It's so broad. Okay, I'll take this question, the last one, then you can ask otherwise. Um, I wrote an article in a law review about 3D printed guns. And I wrote that I think 3D printed guns are protected by the First and Second Amendment. Cody read my article. He called me out of the blue and said, I want to hire you to sue the government. Like, what are you, insane? Uh, this is, I think, my second or third year teaching. It was pretty early on. Um, and we talked about the case. I learned more. I was like, OK, I'm in. And I helped recruit Alan Gura, who was our lead attorney. He dropped out of the case eventually. I have other counsel helping us. Uh, but uh, I've been around the ride for almost five years. 
almost six years now, actually. Anything else? Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.